Uh, we are in the middle of a series of messages right now that we're calling Simple Faith. And the whole idea behind this uh, series is that faith is inherently complex. Uh, it is inherently difficult, and it, it, it just runs deep, and it sprawls into every little corner of our lives, and, and it's mysterious. It's something like a puzzle that has an unknown number of pieces and an, uh, and an, an unknown picture on the box. And so what we're trying to do in this series is we just want to build uh, the edges of the puzzle. We want to find some basic core beliefs that are, are relatively straightforward and easy to say, that are capable of being built upon and developed and explored even further, and that uh, are distinctly Christian. And so far, that's led us to think about three things. It's led us to think about uh, God, that God is a community of uh, three distinct individuals who are, they, they share in a common essence and common nature and common will. This is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then when we talked about uh, humanity, we talked about humans have an oughtness to us. Uh, that humans have a way of being in the world that we are supposed to embody that is seen only in Jesus. And then uh, last week we talked about uh, Jesus, that the, the big deal about Jesus, the core thing that we believe about Jesus is that he has been raised from the dead. Today we're going to talk about the last edge of this puzzle before we move to wrapping up the whole series next week. Today, I want to ask the question, what is faith? And faith is something of a slippery word. It's a word that it seems like as many different people as there are using the word, there are that many definitions. Sometimes what we mean by the word faith is it is a person's worldview. It's a, a, a person's thoughts and, and feelings and beliefs that have to do with the supernatural and have to do with uh, things that are philosophical. It's the story that a person believes about who they are, where they are in the world, and, and what they believe about God. Sometimes what we mean by the word faith is uh, simply that it's a conviction that's held very strongly in the absence of evidence. And so uh, if we have a jury that's gone out to decide a case, we might say, I have, just, or I have faith that justice is going to prevail. Well, we don't know that justice is going to prevail, but we have a, a strong, optimistic outlook on that. And so sometimes faith also is just another word for optimism. You know, you just got to have faith, man. Well, faith in what? Just faith. You just got to have faith. And it doesn't really seem to have a whole lot more meaning than that. For some people, faith is a really ugly word that comes with a lot of negative connotations and they associate it with religious violence. And for others, everybody has a faith because it's just whatever you believe about the divine. Even if you believe there is no God, that's, that's your faith. Uh, so there, people use this word in all different kinds of ways. And that's why I say it's slippery and that's why I think we need to talk about it this morning. As Christians, our understanding of what faith is derives from the way that the word is used in the Bible. Uh, the Bible is the church's book, and so we want to use the word faith the way that the Bible does. And in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, there is faith, and there is the faith. And there's a difference. The word is used in these two different ways. There's faith, and there is the faith. The faith refers to the body of teachings and doctrines and, and understandings of who Jesus is, uh, that he was born a human and that he died for our sins and that he was raised from the dead and that he is Lord and that he's coming again. Uh, the faith is not a set of doctrines about uh, the timelines for the end of the world or a certain church polity or how the church is going to be organized or how the church should worship. The faith is just this cluster of teachings about who Jesus is and what happened in the Christ event. So, for example, 
when the Apostle Paul was writing about what makes for a good deacon, he's writing in 1 Timothy chapter 3, this is what he says, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Which is to say, if someone is going to serve as a deacon in a church, they need to have a, a, a conviction about this cluster of teachings about who Jesus is. They can't be shaky on Jesus. The faith. Another example comes from the book of Jude, verses 3 and 4. Jude says, writing to a church, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation... I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Well, why would you need to defend the faith? For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus. Why do you need to contend for, fight for, stick up for the faith? It's because there are people who deny Jesus and pervert the grace of God. So whatever the faith is, it has something to do with Jesus, and it has to do with the grace of God in Jesus. And then I'll give you one more example. This is probably the most famous example of this. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. Paul, at the end of his life, says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, which is not to say that he has always kept optimistic. He's always kept his chin up. You just got to have faith. Oh, I've always had faith. It's that he hasn't denied who Jesus is. He has maintained the strict cluster of teachings about Jesus to the end of his days. So there's the faith, and then there's faith. Uh, faith is believing that body of teaching, and it is living in response to it. Uh, it is organizing my life in a way that reflects that body of teaching. And so the faith is the body of teaching itself about who Jesus is. And then faith can be used in two different ways. One is the posture of my heart toward that teaching. When that teaching has its way on me and and my mind is transformed and my heart is transformed, that's called faith. Although sometimes we'll use the word belief or conviction or uh, trust. So I have faith that Jesus was raised from the dead. I have faith that Jesus is Lord. I believe, I accept, I affirm the faith. Was that making sense so far? Good. Good. One way that this is used, or that faith is used in this way, is in Hebrews 11, which is probably the classical definition of faith that most of us go to right away. Hebrews 11, verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So to have faith is to believe something that you can't definitively prove. Uh, In the Christian context, it's specifically believing this body of teaching about Jesus. It's affirming as true what what the church says about Jesus. One more example is in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. John is writing to a church, and he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. The word believe is the word faith. In, in English, we have two, two different words. We have the word faith, and then we have the word belief. And there's a lot of overlap between those two, but we have two different words. But John is originally writing in Greek, and it's been brought into English. In Greek, there's just one word. It's the word pistis. Faith. Belief. Uh, and so I, have, I write these things to you who pistis in the name, those of you who faith in the Son of God. So we have the body of teaching, the faith. We have faith as a, uh, a, a, an in, inner disposition toward the faith that I believe, that I trust. And then sometimes we'll talk about faith as a way of life. It's a way of living in response to that body of teaching. 
And, and then we'll use words like faithfulness or allegiance or loyalty. And we're still talking about the word pistis. For example, in Hebrews chapter 13, which Hebrews, if you don't know, is uh, an early Christian sermon. And this is what uh, the, the, the preacher says in chapter 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So faith is set in parallel with a way of life. It's something that you do. Faith is something that can be imitated. Uh, I'll give you one more example. I know I'm kind of flipping around here a lot, but Revelation chapter 2, Jesus is speaking to uh, one of his churches. In chapter 2, verse uh, 19, to the church in Thyatira, he says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. So faith is grouped in with things that are done, love and patience and service. So when Christians talk about my faith, I want to talk to you about my faith this morning. We're talking about our habits and our behaviors and our actions and disciplines and choices that we do because of the body of teaching. This is one of the ways that the word pistis is used. So you have the faith, you have faith as an inner response, and you have faith as an external response. And they're all the same word, the same idea that are all swirling together. So to come back to the question for this morning... What is faith, anyway? And maybe we could answer it like this. Faith is the story of Jesus and our responses to it. It's the story of Jesus and our responses to it in both heart and mind and in our behaviors and habits and actions. And that's probably too roundabout a way of getting to what I think is ultimately a a relatively straightforward answer. What is faith? It's the story of Jesus and our responses to it. It's not terribly hard to say, although I probably muddied it too much trying to get there. Now the question becomes, does that understanding of faith take us any deeper? Can we take that and explore it and unpack it and, and can we move with that? And put together some more of the puzzle. Does this affect anything else? And of course, it does. Uh, One important question that this raises is, what saves us? Is it the faith, the story of Jesus, that saves us? Or is it our inner reaction, our, our belief that saves us? Or is it our external reaction to the story that saves us? Lutherans would say it is the story that saves you. It is the word of God. Uh, And so when the word is preached over you, that's what saves you. And if you believe, it's simply that's a reaction to the fact that you've been saved. Uh, Baptists, evangelicals, non-denoms would say that it is the belief. It's the inner disposition that I accept that to be true. And that's what saves me. And then there are still others who would say, well, if you believe, but that doesn't produce any change in your life, that belief is void. Uh, Faith without works is dead. And so it is our loyalty, it's our allegiance that saves us. So that's a question that this produces. Another question, what all is included in the faith? What exactly is part of this body of teaching that we call the, the faith, the Christian faith? Uh, last week we said that the fundamental thing Christians believe is that Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah? That's part of that cluster of, like, that's the story. But is there anything else that's part of the faith? I think there is. But what is part of that? That's another question that this raises for us. Uh, Where does belief come from? Some people believe in Jesus and some people don't. So where does that belief come from? Does it come from God working in us? And I I couldn't believe unless God did it to me. 
And if that's the case, then why doesn't he do it to my neighbor? On the other hand, if I'm the one who is responsible for my belief, then is my belief then a work, that I'm being saved by my own works? What does it mean to be loyal to Jesus? In Churches of Christ, I think we have an unfortunate history of uh, thinking that loyalty to Jesus is expressed first and foremost in having proper church governance and having worship just so. And as long as we get those two things in line, that's faithfulness to Jesus. But is loyalty a matter of doing church right? Or is it a matter of becoming a social justice warrior? Or is it a matter of tolerance and love and the removal of all boundaries? What is it that that following Jesus means and, and, and looks like? So faith is the story of Jesus and our responses to it. But what is that story? And what are those responses? And I would submit the small groups and sermons and Sunday school classes and and getting together for lunch and coffee and all that, those conversations are focused on refining our responses and on rehearing the story, hearing it again and again and again. And as we hear it anew, we're being moved anew to respond anew. This idea that faith is the story of Jesus and our responses to it is relatively straightforward. And it is capable of producing more conversation and taking us deeper, and it's something that we can get lost in. And I submit that it is distinctly Christian. The story of Jesus, our belief in the story of Jesus, and the way of life that the story of Jesus produces is what we mean by the word faith. Is that what anybody else means by the word faith? It's not. Now, we might say, well, maybe for a Muslim, the word faith is the story of Muhammad and believing the story of Muhammad and a way of life informed by the story of Muhammad. But that's not like a subtle, slight difference. That's a cataclysmic difference. That's a seismic difference. Uh, Faith for the church is not a matter of being a good person, but of recalling and reenacting and reaffirming uh, and, and rediscovering the story of Jesus. Jesus is what's defining for our faith. And if you take Jesus out and swap in anybody else, you have so radically transformed it that it is just simply not the same thing. Uh, it's not like you could just swap Jesus out with another figure from a different Uh, major religious person and wind up with essentially the same religion. You would wind up with something that's completely different. And even though other faiths have recognized an important place for Jesus, which should tell us something about his importance, that Jesus has an important place even in Islam and in Baha'i and in some branches of Hinduism, that should tell us something about how important he is. But none of those are arranged around him. None of them are defined by Jesus. None of them would put Jesus in the definition of the word faith. And yet every Christian tradition does, whether we're talking Methodist or Lutheran or Baptist or Pentecostal and so on. You guys have got the drill by now. It's been four weeks. For the last four weeks, we've been talking about the edges of this puzzle that is simple faith. Right, so we can imagine a puzzle with four sides. Right? One is that God is a community, three distinct individuals who have a common essence and will in nature. Two, human beings have an oughtness about us that is seen only in Jesus. Third, Jesus rose from the dead, historically, literally, physically, actually rose from the dead in an actual place, an actual time, in an actual political and, and economic and social and racial context. And four, faith is the story of Jesus and our responses to it, both in belief and in fidelity. That's not terribly hard for us to wrap our minds around. And that is certainly capable of taking us deeper into faith. And all of it is distinctly Christian. Nobody else is saying any of that. 
And yet every major stream of Christianity is, because that is what's defining and central. Those are fixed points. Now, when I was a kid, I had a Rubik's Cube. Did anybody else have a Rubik's Cube? Okay, God bless you. One of the things, that you, if you fiddle with a Rubik's Cube long enough, one of the things you realize is that the center squares never move. Right? On each face of this cube, you have nine little squares, and the one in the middle never moves. It's like on a die, like dice. Right? You have the one and the six are always on opposite sides, and the two and the five are always on opposite sides, and the three and the four are always on opposite sides, and the one, two, and three are always together. Four, five, and six are together. The odds are together. The evens are together. And no matter how much you roll the die, that those things always stay together, right? They don't move. It's the same way with a Rubik's Cube. That no matter how much you twist and turn this thing, the red center and the orange center are always opposite each other. Do you realize that? And the yellow and the white are always opposite each other. And the green and the blue are always opposite. It's like these, you have these fixed points, and no matter how much you twist and turn and try to solve, those things don't move. These four things that we've talked about, God is community, human oughtness, uh, Jesus rising from the dead, and faith as belief and our response, or as, as the story and our response to it. Those are like centerpieces. Those things don't move. Even as we have other conversations about, well, what is it that saves us and, and uh, the, uh, how, how ought the church to be organized? What about women's roles? And what about suffering and violence? And all these other conversations that faith entails, these things don't move. It's not like you can only call it Christian faith once the whole thing has been solved. What makes it Christian faith is the centerpieces, the fixed points. And it's within that context that we have all the other conversations. So next week, we need to have one more talk. We need to ask, how do I get started? Where do I go from here? And to use the categories from this morning, if I have heard the story and I have accepted it and believed it to be true, then what should be my response? And we're going to talk about that next week, but for this morning... I want to close us with prayer, and if you have questions about baptism or you're ready to be baptized, then I would invite you to come talk with me during this next song. Let's pray. Our Father, we give you the thanks that you have brought us into this faith. We thank you for this marvelous story of Jesus, uh, and we, we pray that you will make us worthy of his name. I pray that you will create faith in us and that you will teach us about fidelity. I pray that you will make us into people who love you and people who reflect your image in the world. I thank you for all these weeks that we've had thinking about simple faith, and I pray that you will plant it deep in us. Please be with us as we go this week. I pray that you will that you'll be nudging us and opening our eyes. We pray this in the name of Jesus and by the power of your spirit. And the church says, Amen. I love you guys. <laughs>